So tonight, before we uh, get into God's Word, I kind of just want to reiterate some things that you all already know, but um, it's the reality that we live in, in a world of, of, obviously, of turmoil, both spiritually and physically, um, especially lately in the news. All we're hearing is about, you know, moral corruption amongst uh, who people would consider to be leaders or who should be leaders in, in our society, in our communities, in our country. Um, we're hearing of incomprehensible violence that's going on around our world. You know, obviously we had what happened in, in Las Vegas where 58 people lost their lives. We had the, uh, that tragic incident in Sutherland, Texas where 26 people lost their lives. Over 250 people were killed in Egypt over the last weekend in a terrorist attack. So we have a lot that we have to face in this world and sometimes we get discouraged, right? And sometimes we forget to, uh, to look to the Lord and remember that He is sovereign and He's in charge. And, you know, we see all those things, but then what about the other things that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis? You know, we're impacted by those things and sometimes personally impacted and other times we're impacted because we care for our fellow man and we don't like to see what's going on. But then we all deal with our own personal issues, sickness, right, disease, addiction, and then just sin in general that each of us struggle with every day. Those things are, are battles that we have to fight spiritually. And we're going to talk tonight about a lot of different things. But the reason I'm up here speaking tonight, and we're going to talk in 1 Samuel 17, is because the Lord put this topic on my heart after the Sutherland, Texas shooting. I, we had already had a meeting. I don't know if you all know or not, but we have an awesome group of servants in a ministry here at this church, which is safety team ministry. And what those uh, folks do is they basically, um, the Lord's put it on their heart to be servants and protectors of God's people. And they choose to stand in the gap between anything that would want to bring harm to you all physically and um, the enemy. And so we had already talked about we were going to have a meeting and uh, it was going to be on a Sunday afternoon, and it happened, it was scheduled for the Sunday following um, when the Sutherland, Texas massacre occurred. And when I was thinking about things that week and what I wanted to share with the safety team, um, the Lord put this passage of scripture on my heart in a different way than what I'm going to share it tonight. But that's really where this came about. And as I, as I spoke to those men and, and we talked about the things that are going on and what our responsibilities are here to God's people, it just struck me that, you know, maybe sometimes um, I don't share it enough with God's people, with all of you, um, just how protected we are because of the God that we serve. And I think sometimes we forget that because we see those things that happen. And so as I prayed and sought the Lord about what he wanted me to teach when Pastor Raj asked me to teach last week, and I, this is where the Lord brought me. He said, I want you to, I want you to share what you shared with the safety team, but I, there's going to be more to it than that. And so I said, okay, God, whatever you want, that's what I'm here for. That's what I'm going to do. And so here we are. And, you know, sometimes those enemies that we face in this world, sometimes those things that we hear, they, they look or they seem to be unbeatable, right? We get discouraged. Um, we get afraid, right? Maybe sometimes we even get terrified. When you hear those stories, you may physically feel fear, just thinking about what people had to endure or perhaps things that you've had to endure in your own life. So today we're going to look at the story of, of David and Goliath. Obviously it's a familiar story, um, but I want to look at some key aspects to this battle that was we as Christians, I think, really need to, to practice so that we, like David, can experience the victory. And this battle that, that we're going to talk about today, it's, it's definitely spiritual no doubt about it. Everything is at its core. We're going to talk more about that. But it's physical battle sometimes too. And so we're going to talk just a little bit about what God's Word has to say about that. So before we get into God's Word, let's, uh, let's pray. And then we'll see what the Lord has for us. Father God, you are an awesome God. And Lord, how great you are. And Lord, how thankful we are that we serve a, a God who's faithful. A God who is victorious a God who gives us strength and wisdom and courage, peace and comfort. 
You provide all that we need, Lord, and you're a God that has promised that when we accept you, Jesus, into our lives, you will never leave us nor forsake us, and your Holy Spirit will dwell within us. So, Lord, we never have to stand alone, and we never have to deal with anything alone, and, Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you for who you are, and tonight, God, we want to hear what you have for us. Lord, each one of us are here for a reason. You brought us here tonight for a reason. And God, we just pray that your Holy Spirit would minister to our hearts. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak through me, God. I don't want this to be about me or my opinions, Lord, because those don't matter. God, I want it to be about the truth of your word and just how great you are. And so, Lord, we, uh, we look forward to what you're going to do tonight. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So I, I just want to quickly summarize um, kind of where we're at. We're going we're gonna to start in verse 31, but I kind of want to summarize through the first 30 verses quickly, um, hit just a couple key aspects, and then we'll get into uh, the meat of the study. But, you know, first of all, where we are is, is we, are, we are about to witness a battle, a battle between the Philistines and the Israelites. And this battle is occurring in a place called the, the Valley of Elah. And this valley, doing some research, because I had no idea where it fell geographically, um, I looked up some pictures of, of the valley, um, pretty beautiful place, I, actually not too much different than, than some of the areas that we have here in our own county. And what the Bible tells us is that, that uh, the Philistine army was on one hilltop and the Israelite army was on another hilltop with the valley in between, and beautiful green area. And the Philistines were there to fight with Israel, and there had been a, an ongoing battle for, for many, many years that, that the Israelites had been warring with the Philistine army. And as this battle was brewing and it was about to occur and the armies were assembling, a, uh, a Philistine soldier, a champion the Bible calls him, steps forward. He's a giant of a man. Uh, the Bible tells us that, that he, he potentially about six cubits and a... And a and more, he, he potentially could have been up to nine feet tall. Uh, huge person. You think about Paul Clemens, right? He's about 6'5", six, 6'6", six, six, right? Imagine adding a couple feet to Paul Clemens and, and 200 pounds of armor and weaponry. And he's standing there, and he is the Philistine, the representative of the Philistine army. He's the one that they sent to call out Israel. And then Goliath, he issues a challenge to God's people. He steps forward and he issues a challenge to any Israelite soldier who wants to fight him one-on-one. -on -one. And he says, if you come and you fight me and you're victorious, then we the Philistines will surrender to Israel. And if, if I kill you, then you, the Israelites, will surrender to Philistine. And this wasn't too uncommon of a practice then because it would save, obviously, countless resources and lives if you had your two warriors battle on behalf of the army themselves. And so that's what Goliath was calling out. But the problem comes with Saul, the Israelite leader. The Bible tells us in verse 11 here in, in 1 Samuel 17, it says that, that Saul and the entire Israelite army lost their courage and were terrified. Well, those of you, some of you in here are veterans and served in the military, and some of you were in law enforcement or other public service, and, you know, there's times where things are scary, but the last thing you want your military to do is lose um, their belief in themselves to fight and to win, right? When they become terrified or fearful, everybody sees it, and it's contagious, and it's a poison amongst all of the troops. And not only was it the army that lost the courage, but their leader. They saw the fear in Saul. They saw that he was terrified. They saw that he wasn't willing to step up and fight Goliath, nor was anybody else in the Israelite army. But I think what's important to remember here is that this is Israel, right? This is the army who God had given victory to over and over again against unbelievable odds, right, throughout history. And yet in this particular situation, much like we do, they focused only on the size of the earthly enemy, and they forgot about the size of their infinite God, right? They were focused on the earthly and they forgot about the eternal. And so then the Bible talks a little bit about David, introduces us in this particular scene to David, and he at the time is a youth, maybe 16 to 18 years old, maybe at the most, 
Um, he was not of military age, hence he was not at the battle line. So we know he was less than 20 years old, because that was generally 19 to 20 was military age in that time. So David was the youngest of Jesse's sons, and Jesse's sons, his older sons, were, were there on the battle line. They were fighting with Israel. Jesse was old at this time, so he was not. And what the Bible tells us is that this challenge from Goliath went on for not a day, not two days, not a week, but for 40 days, 40 days and 40 nights. Every day, Goliath would step out in front of the Israelite army, and he would call them on the carpet and say, who's going to fight me? Where are you at? Here I am. And nobody did anything, right? Perhaps Saul and his generals thought that if they ignored the threat, that it would just go away. How many of us have done that? The battle that's before us, the obstacle, the call that God puts on our hearts, the trouble, the, the things we've got to deal with, the hard things we need to share with somebody. And what do we think? If we ignore it, maybe it'll go away, right? Maybe that's what Saul and the Israelites did here. But it didn't go away, and it never does. Because God doesn't call his people to avoidance, right? God calls us as his people to action, and we're going to talk more about that. And then, interestingly, Jesse calls David, and David, and he tells David, hey, I want you to go and check on your brothers at the battle line. I want you to take this food and these supplies, and I want you to let me know how they're doing there. And so David says, okay, Dad, I'll do what you've asked. But I think what, what I thought was interesting here is that the timing is perfect in this, right? David would have never gone to that battle line until his father sent him there. And so David goes down there just when God needs him to. And I was reading through David Gusick's commentary. You guys remember a few months ago, David Gusick came and, and taught here. And he, uh, he writes an interesting commentary. And, and one of the things that he pointed out that I hadn't really thought of, and I think it's, it's definitely worthy of, of bringing up, and that is the Bible tells us in verse 20 that when Jesse asked David to go, um, David went, but it says that he left his flock in the care of another. And I think what's important here, what, what the commentary pointed out, was that, that that shows already David's heart of a shepherd, right? It shows already that his understanding of was he's, when he's entrusted to something, it's his to care for. It was what God had given him, and it was his responsibility to make sure that in his absence, it was taken care of. And I think that's something all of us can learn as well, because... Oftentimes, God's given us a responsibility, and sometimes when we're not around, we don't make sure somebody else takes care of it for us, do we? We assume that'll happen, but we don't make sure, right? We kind of, hey, it's, and this is me I'm talking to, it's kind of nice to be able to, to walk away and take a little break for a while, right? Maybe that's what David was thinking, but nonetheless, he knew that flock and those sheep were his responsibility, and he left somebody to care for them. And then as David gets to the battle line and he's speaking with his brothers, he witnesses what's been going on for 40 days now. He sees Goliath come out. He hears what Goliath has to say. He sees the fear in the Israelite army. And then I'm sure to his dismay, he hears of a bribe that, that King Saul basically put out there, right? Because money talks. It talks these days. It talked back then, right? And what did Saul say? Saul said, hey, if Somebody wants to go fight Goliath, I'll give you my daughter as a princess. I'll give you a bounty, right? I'll give you some money. And guess what? I'll defer your taxes for a little while. How does that sound? <laughs> right? Who doesn't want their taxes deferred? But even with a bribe, nobody in Israel, nobody in the army of Israel had the courage to step up and to fight Goliath, an enemy who was discouraging them, who had basically accomplished what he wanted to, and that was to take the fight out of them before the fight even started. And more importantly, what David saw was the disrespect for Israel and more important for God himself. David's own brother at this point, when he went to him, questioned David's reasoning for being there, discouraged him, told him, what are you doing here? You got no business being here. Why? You know, he, he interpreted that David was basically trying to get somebody to step up and fight Goliath. His own brother was against him. And David wasn't focused on the danger, but what he was focused on was his people and honoring God. 
Those were his two most important reasons for being there. And Saul heard that David was inquiring about what's going on. Why isn't somebody dealing with this? What is this offer that's being made? And so Saul summoned David to him. And so that's where we're going to start reading in God's word here. So if you will, just read with me verses 31 and 32. It says, And what David said was overheard and reported to Saul, so he had David brought to him. And David said to Saul, Don't let anyone be discouraged by him. Your servant will go and fight this Philistine. No hesitation. No beating around the bush. No, hey, are you sure there's not somebody that's going to step up and do this? Not, hey, am I going to get this reward if I do this? No, he said, you know what? Don't let anybody be discouraged by him because I'm going to go take care of this problem for you. David stepped up and, and he did it at risk to himself. He did it to defend Israel, but more importantly, he did it to honor God. And he didn't ask somebody else to fight his battle. David volunteered to fight Goliath, and this was his service to God and to Israel. David did what no soldier in the entire Israelite army was willing to do. David had a heart of service, and he had a heart of sacrifice toward God and his people. He didn't put himself first. He put the Lord first. I think there's no doubt that sometimes God calls other people to help us in our battles. No doubt about it. That's why we have our brothers and sisters in Christ. That's why we have our pastors and our leaders and people that we can go to for counsel and for prayer. But I think sometimes too often we like to put that responsibility on somebody else even when God's calling us to deal with it. I think I'm guilty of it going to Pastor Tim or to Pastor Raj or to other people and pointing out something that needs to be taken care of here at the church that I see instead of going and doing it myself. But I'm called as a, as a servant of the Lord, right? Whether I was a leader in this church or not, I'm called as a servant of the Lord and I'm part of his family and I'm part of his church. Sometimes at work, we want to put that on other people too when we know it's our responsibility and even in our home and and then when we look at situations like have happened recently, like what happened in that church, maybe we put the responsibility on somebody else, right? How, many, how much finger pointing do we see going on in our society? We always want to put the blame or find fault or whatever in somebody else. And sometimes there's just no explanation, right? But we do have to remember that when God calls others to stand with us, to fight for us, to fight with us, we need to welcome them in and not push them away. Look at verse 33. It says, But Saul replied, You can't go fight this Philistine. You're just a youth, and he hasn't been, or and he has been a warrior since he was young. So here's the one guy in 40 days that's willing to step up and do what Saul. And none of his army are willing to do, and he's going to question him about it. You can't go fight this guy. Look at you. You're young. Uh, look at him. He's a giant. He's got warrior prowess. He's got experience, right? He didn't trust that David could do this because he was looking at David. He wasn't looking at God. This is the second word of discouragement that David had been given. The first was by his brother. And the second now by his king. And this type of discouragement is common in our lives today, right? How many times do people discourage you and what you set out to do? Or maybe you get excited to tell them about what God's done in your life. And they, maybe they throw out one of the, oh, that's just a coincidence. Or, you know what, maybe you want to you wanna step up to serve in some capacity. Or you want to go on a mission trip. Or, or you want to go evangelize. And people tell you, well, you've been a Christian for... Two weeks, two days, 24 hours, 30 years. But what do you know about that? You're not trained to do that. You don't have experience in that. Right? Or, or you want to step up and you want to do the right thing and say the right thing and address something that's not proper in your workplace. People tell you, don't rock the boat. Don't do that. All that's going to do is cause you problems. Right? We're going to face that discouragement. Or maybe... 
you're told, listen, if something like that comes to you, if something like that comes to this church, what are you going to do? You can't protect yourself. Right? People love to discourage other people. But God is not a God of discouragement. He's a God of encouragement. Think about it. How many people in response to the recent tragedies that have occurred, and I heard it in both the Las Vegas shooting and, and in the, the Sutherland uh, Springs shooting, but how many people did you hear say, well, prayer's not enough, right? When Christians are saying, we need to pray, we need to pray for our country, we need to pray for these victims, we need to pray for our first responders, or you need to pray for the leadership in this country to make wise decisions if and how they can deal with these things. And people say prayer is not enough. Are you kidding me? <laughs> prayer is all we need. And then God will show us what we need to do, and then it's the action. But it's the, it starts with us seeking the Lord in what His will is. Right? Because it's obvious man can't get it right. That's what we should be saying. It's obvious the government's not enough. It's obviously that it's obvious the laws aren't enough. It's obvious that the mental health treatment we currently have is not enough. It's obviously that the family life and the family raising wasn't enough. That's obvious. To us as Christians, prayer is the answer. And we can't be discouraged when people put aside the power of God, of His Word, and of prayer. We'll face this discouragement, but if God calls you to a situation, to a trial, to a battle, He's going to give you what you need to get through it. He's going to give you what you need to be victorious. Our God is a God of victory. He's not a God of survival. Right? We don't just survive a situation. Right? In a physical sense, I could survive a confrontation as a law enforcement officer and be paralyzed for the rest of my life. Okay? That, that would be survival. Or I can be victorious and I can maybe get injured, but I go home to my family and I live... The, the life that God has for me. But my point being is that our God is a God of victory, right? He's not a God of survival. We can't say, well, we can survive with the Lord. No, we're going to win with the Lord. That's what we're going to do. We must also guard against questioning and doubting like Saul did, right? Because how often have we been the person saying what Saul said to David, right? Right? Maybe it wasn't even intentional. Sometimes it, our loved ones are the ones that cut the deepest, not because they mean to, right? Not because they intend to, but sometimes their discouragement cuts the deepest, and we need to be careful that we're not that person. The people that God has placed in our lives to fight that battle or to assist us in it, as we talked about a minute ago, we've got to make sure that we support them and we encourage them and we thank them for their willingness to stand with us. And sometimes those are our church leaders or even our government leaders, whether you agree with what side of the aisle they sit on or not, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Sometimes, and we've seen throughout history, not sometimes, all the time, the people that are in authority are because God put them there for a reason. Good, bad, or indifferent, God put them there for a reason. And if God put them there, then we need to respect the fact that, we're there, that they're there and we need to be encouragers and not discouragers to those people. We don't want to be what Saul was. And we can't allow the prowess or the experience of whatever that enemy is, whatever that trial is, whatever that battle is, we can't allow those things to deter us. When we're called to, to do the battle in honor of our God and for the protection of his people, then we go and we do it and we trust the Lord. Look at verse 34. It says, And David answered Saul, Your servant has been tending his father's sheep, and whenever a lion or a bear came and carried off a lamb from the flock, I went after it. I struck it down, and I rescued the lamb from its mouth. If it reared up against me, I would grab it by its fur, strike it down, and kill it. Some translations say grab it by its throat. And your servant has killed lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. Then David said to that the Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, go and may the Lord be with you. How great would it be to have that faith, right? How awesome would that be? We can. 
each one of us, we can have that faith, right? God's word is chock full of, in our lives and the lives of our loved ones and our brothers and sisters in Christ are chock full of stories and testimony of God showing up and God rescuing and God empowering and God fulfilling his promises. We can have that faith, the faith that David had. The other thing that is interesting here is that God had been preparing David all of this time for this very moment, right? Not only spiritually, but physically, right? David did physical battle with a lion and a bear, which would be quite hair-raising, I would imagine, right? And he's talking about it like, hey, this thing came at my sheep, and I'm protecting the sheep because that's my responsibility as the shepherd, and I grabbed that thing by the throat, and I took care of it. That's pretty cool. I wish I could go to David's martial arts school because I would love to learn how to get a bear by the throat and take care of business, right? If you can do that, a person would be easy. But God prepared him physically and spiritually for that very moment. David's experience in protecting the sheep is how God prepared him. And David's faithfulness in doing what he'd been called to do, because being a shepherd isn't that great of a task, right? You're sleeping out in the field. You're chasing animals all, all around. You stink, right? It's, it's, it's something that you're responsible for on a regular basis, and there's always things that are going to happen, right? I mean, think about how difficult it is sometimes as a parent chasing your kids around. Now imagine you got 25 sheep in a field with wild animals or that are wandering off or whatever it might be. But David stayed faithful to his calling, right? And the Lord used that experience to prepare him for this battle. God also showed David his faithfulness. He allowed David to experience his faithfulness because he provided David with the protection and with the strength when he faced those predators who were determined to harm the sheep. And think about the parallel of that for a minute. You know, I talked about the guys that the Lord's put on their heart to serve this church in a role of protector. Right? And we, as God's people, are his sheep. And they, in the role that they've stepped up to fulfill, are shepherds to the sheep. Right? And there's other people. You don't have to be a part of that ministry to be a shepherd to the sheep. Right? When you serve, when you help a brother or sister in Christ, that's protecting them. Right? That's building their faith. That's encouraging them. So there's lots of ways to do it, but that's the way that David learned to be a protector and to defend his God and his nation. And God enabled David to have the skill and the will to protect his flock. David knew that God would empower him here so that he could protect the sheep of Israel from the predator Goliath. In verse 37, I really want to want to focus on that for just a second because I think the thing that's important here was David reflected on God's past faithfulness. And I know I've said that from up here before, but man, we don't do very good at that. We have short memories of God's faithfulness in our lives. And we need to reflect daily on God's faithfulness. Because if we don't, it's easy to get distracted and it's easy to get discouraged and it's easy to feel weak and it's easy to feel vulnerable. But when we remember the faithfulness of our God, it's easy to be strong and it's easy to stand at the battle line and know that God is going to be there for you because he's done it over and over and over again. He did, David did what Saul and the Israelites failed to do. He kept his eyes on the Lord, he kept his trust in the Lord, and he remembered the Lord's faithfulness and his promises. I have to think that David probably had a pretty good recollection and memory of all the things that God had delivered the Israelites from over the years. You know, in those days, um, in the Jewish culture, they knew the Old Testament, and they knew it well, and he would have known the history of his people. And I believe that David not only reflected on the personal faithfulness of the Lord, but he also looked at the faithfulness of the Lord for his people, for the history of his people, just like we can with our family and our friends and the others who've come before us, maybe have, who've even already gone and think about the faithfulness of the Lord in their lives. Right? I think about my grandfather who, he passed away in 2016, but he, he fought in World War II. He survived cancer. He served the Lord for 
so many years in his life and he was such an impact to me, right? And so that memory of God's faithfulness to my grandfather carries on to me and encourages me and strengthens me. And we all have those stories. David also made sure that he acknowledged that his ability came from God and not from his own strength. He knew that it was from the Lord and from the Lord alone. He said right here, the Lord who rescued me, he knew he was rescued. He didn't say, man, the Lord made me good and I took care of these things. No, he said, the Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. David knew he needed rescuing when he, what he was about to do. He knew he couldn't do it in his own strength. The experiences that God gives us and has allowed us to experience all are part of the preparation for things to come. I don't know what that's going to be. You don't know what that's going to be. Right? But I can tell you, um, I've seen it very clearly in my life in many different situations. The things that the Lord has allowed me to experience later came into play. To draw off that experience. To draw and to have the ability to minister to others because of what the Lord allowed me to go through and to experience. The things we experience today will teach us and prepare us for our future battles and the situations that we're called to deal with or help others in. We've got to remember to reflect on God's faithfulness and to do it often. You know, I, I had the opportunity a few years ago to do a study of um, kind of what the Bible teaches and about self-defense, and I studied a lot of the warriors in the Bible, and and one of the things that, that I found, and I would encourage you to do the same, because like I said, I, I, there, there is always and most importantly a spiritual application to everything, even when there's physical um, involvement. It's spiritual at the core. And as, if you look at the great warriors in the Bible, both the great spiritual warriors and the great physical warriors, and some of them were both, but you'll see that without exception, every one of them that was successful brought glory to God and they were successful only when they trusted in God and relied on his strength and not their own strength or ability. Without exception, that's what you'll find. And David, like all the others, and some of the ones that kind of came to mind when I was doing this study and reflecting on this was Nehemiah and Joshua, of course, and Gideon and Moses and Abraham, right? I mean, what, what battle? I mean, I, I got to teach on, on Abraham and Isaac, and what a battle would that have been for a father to strap his son to a table and be ready to sacrifice him. You talk about a battle spiritually and physically. Abraham was a warrior in that battle because he trusted God. He knew that God had a plan and that it was God calling him to do what he did, and he stepped out in faith. Each of them had reverence and fear in the sovereign power of God, not in the power of man. And I think that's where we fail way too often as Christians is in our flesh, we focus our fear because of our inabilities. But God has no inabilities. And God has promised to give us all that we need. And he's promised to never leave us nor forsake us. So we don't have to rely on our abilities we don't have to worry about our inabilities. We need to trust God in his ability. And some of the verses, I, I'm not going to bring them up on the screen. I, I want to keep things going, but just things maybe to, to look at that will encourage you. Psalms 118.6 and Psalm 56, verses 4 and 11, where it talks about if God's with us, what can man do to us? And Romans 8.31, of course, if God is for us, who can be against us? 2 Timothy 1.7, the verse of our fearless men's ministry, that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but one of power and of love and of a sound mind. And then, of course, Joshua 1.9, be strong and courageous, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Our God is faithful. You'll never find anywhere in Scripture where he hasn't been. When things don't work out, people's way sometimes they say it was because God failed to to be there for them but God doesn't fail anything let's look at verses 38 and 39 it says and then Saul had his own military clothes put on David and he put a bronze helmet on David's head and had him put on armor 
David strapped his sword on over the military clothes and he tried to walk, but he was not used to them. I can't walk in these, David said to Saul. I'm not used to them. So David took them off. So think about that for a minute. Here's the king of Israel who's adorning David in his military armor and clothing. But David knew that those aren't the things that were going to save him, right? I think the Lord purposely made David uncomfortable in that because that wasn't what David had been prepared for. That wasn't what David had trained with. That wasn't the, those weren't the tools and the resources that God had given David. Those were from man. Those were from an earthly king, not the king of kings. David knew that the Lord was going to provide the victory, and so he knew he needed to trust God. And I thought it was interesting, in, in Psalms 20, verse 6, it says this. It says, Now I know the Lord gives victory to his anointed. He will answer him from his holy heaven with mighty victories from his right hand. That's a man speaking from experience. And think about this too, you know. I was, I was thinking about it for a minute, but had David worn Saul's military clothing, and he stepped out to fight Goliath, in the armor and clothing of the king with the king's sword. Who do you think they would have believed or who do you think they would have given the credit to for David's victory? It certainly wouldn't have been the Lord, right? It would have been he was adorned in the king's armor. He fought with the king's sword. Because of the sword of Israel, because of the king's garments, he was victorious, right? They would already took their eyes off the Lord. That's why they were fearful. That's why nobody wanted to step up and fight. So I think it's important to remember that, that sometimes we need to make sure that we adorn ourselves in what the Lord's provided, not what man's provided. Even though in our eyes, maybe what man provided us at the time looks better than what the Lord did, because I bet that armor looked good. I bet David looked pretty sharp, and it had been cool to get a picture, right? But it wasn't what he needed. In the uh, Enduring Word commentary, um, it made this point. It said that often people try to fight with another person's armor. They see God had done something wonderful through someone else, and they try to copy it without really making it their own. Guilty, right? Because our relationship with the Lord is an individual relationship. We're not going to do anything the same way that somebody else does it, that the Lord does it through somebody else. Okay, the Lord specifically has ways in which he wants to use us and minister to us, gifts that he wants to give us, right? Because if we strap on the armor of somebody else because they were successful in that battle, we're going to be like David and it's not going to be comfortable because that's not us. That's not what the Lord had planned for us. Too many times we look at the things of this world to protect us and give us our ability to fight for victory. There's no doubt, obviously, that God uses others and even uses created things to assist us, but it's the creator and the creator alone that gives us the power to overcome in these battles, to overcome the giants that we're going to face and to be victorious. Think about it for a minute. What we're, what we're about to see is the sword and the spear versus the name of the Lord. That's it. The sword and the spear versus the name of the Lord. And let's see what happens with it. Verse 40. So instead, David took his staff in his hand and he chose five smooth stones from the wadi and put them in a pouch in his shepherd's bag. And then with his sling in his hand, he approached the Philistine. The Philistine came closer and closer to David and with the shield bearer in front of him. And I, I want to stop there for just a minute because I think there's some really key points that we need to gather from what David just did right here. The first thing he did was he took the things that God had provided. He picked up the tools that God had given him, his staff and his slingshot. Those were the things that he was comfortable with, familiar with, that God had gifted him to use, right? And so he took those things, but then there's an important and a key thing to catch right here. It says, he approached the Philistine. So he picked up his tools and he approached the Philistine. Then Goliath approached him, right? He knew what he was called to do. He didn't hesitate. 
he was stepping up to the battle line to do what his master had called him to do. These were the tools that God gave him and trained him with, and they're layman's tools for sure. They weren't a soldier's tools, right? People were probably going, this kid is crazy. This is about to get nasty, and no problem's going to be solved, and here we're going to be again tomorrow listening to this dude talk trash to us, right? I mean, that's probably what everybody thought. But David stuck with what God had taught him to use, and he trusted God to give him the victory regardless of what the implements were. It might not have seemed practical to use a staff and a slingshot, but it's what God called him to use. The other thing I think is important there is God ar or David armed himself. And sometimes we have to, always we have to arm ourselves with God's word. We have to adorn the armor that God's given us that we're going to be talking about here pretty soon on Sunday mornings in Ephesians chapter 6. But sometimes we have to arm ourselves with other things, right? Maybe that's the truth, right? Maybe it's a weapon for real in reality. Maybe it's arming ourselves by stripping away our pride, right? Arming ourselves in, a, in, in, in ability to be vulnerable to what God wants, right? Because I know that sounds silly, but the best time, the, most, the strongest we're going to be is what? In our weakness, right? Before the Lord. That's what the Bible teaches us. But I think the other thing here that's interesting is is like God's instruction to Joshua, right? Think about when Joshua was called to, to Jericho and he was supposed to march around the city, right? Seven times and blow horns and trumpets. How silly does that sound? Right? But Joshua did what he was called to do. He stepped up with the implements that God instructed him to use, and he was victorious because God gave him the victory because he was faithful and he was obedient. I wrote down here, it's just kind of a note to myself, but I wrote, the method doesn't matter when we're empowered by the master. And I think that's important to remember sometimes because we try to arm ourselves with too much. I know there's times where I've had discussions with people that I love who don't know the Lord and I've tried to arm myself with, with my knowledge, right, of what I've learned in church over the years and I was going to, you know, go and debate God and prove God to these people and it wasn't empowered by the master, right? I had a method, I had some tools that I thought I was going to use, but it really doesn't matter because... When it's empowered by the master, that may just be a hug. It may be a word of encouragement. It may be, I love you. It may be, you know what? I don't know how to explain what you're asking me, but I can tell you this. The Lord is faithful, and if you seek him, you'll find him. Maybe that's the only word that the Lord's going to allow you to share. But if it's his method, and it's from the master, then it's not going to matter. We're going to win. I also want to just share that, that David put his faith into action here. So, so often, I think, we, we say the words, right? We, we agree with God's word. We say what we're going to do, what we want to do. We're determined, right? We're prepared, maybe even. We even gather our tools, and then we don't step out in faith. So we've got everything we need, but we don't step up to the battle line. We have to be willing to act. We have to be willing to step forward, to take that step forward. Because just like Goliath, who stood there, until David showed his intent, until David had his faith, the enemy didn't move, right? And if we don't engage in the battle, how do we defeat the enemy? So if I gather all my tools and I acknowledge everything and I say, yes, Lord, I know that's what you desire for me, and then I do nothing with it, how do I engage the enemy? How can I have victory if I don't ever step into the battle? And sometimes we have to be willing to do battle. The odds can be against us just like they were against David. The tools can be crude. But oftentimes this is how God shows his sovereignty. It's how God keeps our eyes on him and our trust in him and his word and his faithful promises. So we have to step up to the battle line. Verse 42 
says, and when the Philistines looked and saw David, when the Philistine looked and saw David, he despised him because he was just a youth, healthy and handsome. And he said to David, am I a dog that you come against me with sticks? Then he cursed David by his gods. Come here, the Philistine called to David, and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the sky and to the wild beasts. So something to note here, Goliath is completely self-reliant, right? His self-reliance, his pride, his sin, because of those things, he was offended by the battle that he had to fight, right? He was offended by his competition. He put all of his faith in himself. He only trusted in himself. And then, like people often do, he hurled insults and threats toward David to discourage David and to strip him of his confidence. Why? Because it worked already for the entire Israelite army. That's what he'd been doing for 40 days. But just like Goliath did to David, Satan and this world is going to attempt to belittle us and discourage us and to intimidate us from engaging in the battle that's set before us. Right? In a, in a, in a purely physical sense, this is what people do. This is what predators, people predators who want to prey on others and hurt others, they intimidate them. They belittle them, right? They tell them they're not worthy. Whether they're a predator within their own home or whether they're a mass killer who steps into a church with a rifle on a Sunday morning, they're self-reliant, they're prideful, they're arrogant. They obviously have no trust in the Lord, right? It says that Goliath cursed him by his gods. So we're going to see these things in our life. But like David, we must not allow the world or our enemy to discourage us. We've got to continue to remember our great God and know that he alone will give us the victory. But I think the other thing that's important is we've got to make sure that we don't become like Goliath, right? Overconfident and prideful in our abilities. Because some of us, all of us have gifts. Some of you are gifted tremendously in different ways. And remember the Bible says that to those who are given much, much will be expected. But oftentimes when the Lord gifts us with those things, we start to become self-reliant and prideful and arrogant because we forget that it was the Lord that gave us those abilities. It was the Lord that gifted us with those skills. So we have to be careful that we don't become like Goliath especially when we're facing our enemy. So look at 45 through 47. This is my favorite part. Of course, you guys could suspect that. But David said to the Philistine, you come against me with a dagger, a spear, and a sword, but I come against you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel's armies. You have defied him. Today, <clears throat> the Lord will hand you over to me. Today, I will strike you down, cut your head off, and give the corpses of the Philistine camp to the birds of the sky and the creatures of the earth, then all the world will know that Israel has a God. And this whole assembly will know that it is not by sword or by spear that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's. He will hand you over to us. That's power. That's the power of the Holy Spirit speaking through God's servant. That's the power of the Holy Spirit speaking through somebody who is humble enough to put themselves aside to realize they don't have the ability and to let God empower them. That's what we just saw through David, the power of the Holy Spirit. And not only was it powerful in what David said, but he gives so much credit to the Lord, right? He puts everything in the Lord's hand and, and he declares the victory before the battle even began. That's the fate that God calls us to. We can declare the victory before the battle begins. We might not know what the victory looks like, right? If it's an illness, you know, our brother, Jim Delosier, is dealing with some terrible things right now, right? He's back in the hospital. He doesn't know what the victory is going to look like, but I promise you, God will give him the victory if he trusts in the Lord and he maintains his faith and strength in the Lord, which is what he's doing. God's going to give him the victory. I don't know what it's going to look like, but I'm very confident in it. Because I know that God loves him. I know how much God loves him. 
that he gave his son for Jim and for me and for you, right? And a God who doesn't want to give us victory, who's already won the victory at the cross, he doesn't do that for us. We have the victory. We just have to trust him in it. We can declare the victory before the battle. Just don't get cocky. Just know that it's God that's going to give you the victory. It's not you. David makes it clear that the Lord's going to hand the Philistines over to him. And he was also very specific and graphic, obviously, in his proclamation. And I honestly believe that, that God gave David this insight into the, how the battle was going to progress and what he was going to do. Um, because that very specifically showed God's hand in it. It was prophetic. Right? What David said before the battle began was prophetic. And, and, and anybody who's ever uh, experienced combat or who's, who's seen it or, or studied it or, or watched maybe some of these documentaries, one thing that you'll know, and even, even in, in the business world, right, the best laid plans never go as planned, right? And so it's impossible to, no matter how good you are, no matter how good your army is or your warrior is, it is impossible to walk in and predict exactly what's going to happen in the battle and how it's going to go down and when it's going to go down and then finish it exactly the way that you had prophesied. That's all of the Lord. And I think the Lord gave that to David ahead of time to give him confidence, to build him up, to remind him, I'm here. Don't worry about it. You got this because I've got you. David's statements about what, what was going to occur were, were critical and they were prophetic, not only about Goliath, but about the entire Philistine army. He established that his goal was that the whole world would know that Israel has a God. When we step into battle, whatever that is, if we have our goal as glorifying God, we can't lose. But if I step into battle and my goal is revenge, it's anger, it's to prove somebody wrong, it's to make them look silly, it's anything other than to glorify God, eh, I may be successful occasionally, but I guarantee you you're going to fall on your face eventually. <clears throat> Too often in our flesh we rely on our own strength and I think the other problem, though, is that we pray for God to help us and then we experience that victory or we get through that situation and then we forget that it was by his power that we were successful. Right? I know I've done that. You know, I've been on a lot of uh, different swap missions over the years and there's been times where I've called upon the leaders of this church or other men that are my Christian brothers and I, I've, I've asked them, pray please pray for me and for my team in what we're about to go do or what we have to do because I read about these warriors and I know that the only way that we're going to be successful is if we put our trust in the Lord and not everybody on my team may understand that but I certainly do and uh, I covet the prayers of the men and the women who prayed over me and for me and for my team and I can tell you this in 17 years I'm still standing here and I've never seen any of my guys get hurt and thank God we've never lost any of them. And we've been in some bad situations, but I promise you it was God's hand in it. And if I had the time, I would share the stories so you could understand what I mean by it was God's hand in it. Things that there's no way to explain it. And yeah, as warriors, we want to be able to, a, a warrior longs for a worthy battle, right? Whether, whether it's, it's physical, in a, it, your soldiers, I mean, they don't train to be soldiers, so they never have to go to battle, right? They long for a worthy battle. They long to put their training in into use, but I can tell you this, um, God has already done that for me. Even if I never actually have that physical battle, it's like Nehemiah, right? When he was called to build the wall for Jerusalem, right? And, 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 and he told the, the people that they needed to arm themselves and defend their families. And he was facing criticism and threats daily, but his duty, what God had assigned him to do was to build the wall. But God also told him, be prepared for battle. And I think, I really believe, and I, one day when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask him. But I really believe that the battle never came to Nehemiah because he was faithful and did those things. He was prepared. He kept the people armed. He kept them ready. He kept his faith in God. And he kept his focus on what God had assigned him to do. And because of that, the battle never came. And that's a victory. Right? The battle that we don't have to fight sometimes, 
That's the victory. Other times we're going to have to fight, and it's going to stink, and it isn't going to be pretty, but we're still going to get the victory because we serve an awesome God. Let's look at verse 48. It says, And then uh, when the Philistines started forward to attack him, David ran quickly to the battle line to meet the Philistine. There's a lot in that one verse, but I think that that term right there, David ran to the battle line to meet the Philistine, shows once again his faith and his confidence in the God that he served. He wasn't hesitant at all. He wasn't hesitant about what was about to happen. He wasn't hesitant about what could happen to him. He knew that the victory was secured, and he ran to the battle line. In fact, I even put it, he excitedly engaged in battle, right? Because who wants to run into battle if you're not confident you're going to win, right? I mean, that's human nature. It's self-preservation. Spiritually, we run. When those battles are coming... Run to the battle. Run to the battle in prayer. Run to the battle with the counsel of your brothers and sisters and them praying for you. Run to the battle with God's word in your hand and his word in your heart. But don't be intimidated by the enemy because that's exactly what the enemy wants. But when you pick up God's word and you have it in your heart and you're proclaiming God's name as you run to that battle that Satan set before you, you're going to have victory because Satan cannot resist that. The Bible teaches us that, that the name of Jesus Christ, he's, he's done, right? It's already, we already know the ending. When God calls us to a task, no matter how ominous or seemingly dangerous, when I say dangerous, it may be physical, but what about our reputation, right? How often have we chosen not to fight a battle or stepped up to do what was right because we were worried about our reputation? I've done it. How often have we not proclaimed the name of Jesus because we were worried about our reputation or what somebody might think? We're to run to it. When you get that opportunity, when you see that battle that the Lord's called you to, it's coming one way or another. You can wait 40 days if you want. It's just going to make it last longer. Or you can get ready, you can praise God, and you can run to the battle line. And you can finish it and be victorious. Imagine what would have happened had David sheepishly approached Goliath. Just picture that. Had he had his head down or showed fear or a lack of confidence or an unwillingness to step forward, the battle would have already been lost at that point. David Guzik, and he, he wrote this question, and I've heard this a lot, and I, I, I think it's important that we look at it. And it says, many Christians struggle at this very point. Is God supposed to do it, or am I supposed to do it? The answer is yes. God does it, and we do it with him. Trust God, rely on him, and then get to work, and work as hard as you can, and run right at the enemy. That's how the work of God gets done. The work of God doesn't get done by sitting back and saying, our God can do all things and he's going to do it. There are times where God will do it, and it's awesome. But the majority of the time, the Lord calls us to put our hands to the plow and get to work and to run right at it. And that's how God's work gets done. I think sometimes this has to do with, you know, I the other thing I, I heard... Um, through all this stuff that had happened and specifically in the church shooting were people who said, I actually read a quote from somebody, a, a Christian, or somebody who professed to be a Christian who said, you know, really in situations like that, if, if somebody wanting to commit violence walks in into the, the church, you know, if we can restrain him, we, can, we should restrain him, then we just pray for, for God to, to take control and, and take over the, the situation and protect us. In essence, saying we don't want to put our hands at the plow we're just going to pray that God takes care of, of everything without our faith and without our action, right? And God's word says it, that faith without works is dead, okay? And it breaks my heart. I didn't know if I was going to share this, but I, I feel like I need to share it. It broke my heart that day 
when I heard what happened in that church, and this isn't against those people at all. They're God's people and I love them, but it broke my heart that that what was able to be done was done and nobody stepped up to stop it. Even if it meant they died for it. Because lots of people died anyway. And, and I just, I feel like we as Christians have to remember that we can't just sit back passively and say, God, you take care of it. I don't want to be there. Because that's what the Israelite army did. That's, that's what Saul did, right? And what happened? It didn't go away. For 40 days and 40 nights, that battle was still there, right? It's, it's the world that we live in and evil the spiritual evil, the spiritual things of this world that are evil manifest themselves through people just like God uses his people for good. And we have to remember that. Our battle is not against flesh and blood. There's no doubt about it. This battle right here was spiritual, but it was also absolutely physical, right? Think about Jesus. He was 100% man and 100% God. He was physical and he was spiritual. We're no different. The battles that we face here on this earth are no different. And I pray that I never have to face that battle. But I also pray that if that day ever comes, God gives me the strength and the ability to do what he's called me to do, whatever that is. And I pray at night when I go to bed, I pray over my family and I pray that I pray over our home and I pray that God, if, if uh, need be, awaken me and give me the skill and the ability to protect my family. I pray that every night when I go to bed because I don't know but I want to be willing. I want to be willing like David was to do whatever the Lord calls me to do. From a physical perspective, you know, when I was looking into this and doing my studies, one of the things that the Lord just totally encouraged me with is that we know as Christians, right, that when we die, we're immediately going to be in the presence of our Lord, right? I mean, that's a guarantee. That's a promise of God. It's a truth of the scripture, and we know it as Christians, and, I, and David knew this as well. There's no doubt about it. David knew that regardless of how all this turned out, he was doing it for God and God was going to honor it. And if we know that we're going to be in the presence of the Lord, can we really lose? Honestly, can you lose? You can't. You can't lose. Because if I win the earthly battle, if it is a physical battle and I win, like David did, then I get to remain here with my loved ones and my friends and I get to go home to my family and I get to keep serving the Lord, right? That's a win. But if I lose my life in that battle that I'm called to, then I awake in the presence of my Lord and Savior. And that's a win. So if I can go into whatever battle I face knowing that I cannot lose with God, what can man do to me? Right? That's what Scripture's telling us. When we brought Christ, when we accepted Christ into our lives, when we put our faith in him, it's a win-win. If he keeps you on this earth for 100 years, it's a win because you get to serve him and you get to love people and you get to experience things. And if you lose your life to illness, disease, I know when I was praying for my uncle when he had cancer, I wanted him to live. I did. I prayed that God would heal him. God healed him. He took him into his presence. Praise the Lord for that. It's a win. It's a win. Let's close out here. 49, and, <clears throat> 49 through 51. It says, David put his hand in the bag and took out a stone and he slung it and he hit the Philistine on his forehead and the stone sank into the forehead and he fell on his face to the ground. And David defeated the Philistine with a sling and a stone. And even though David had no sword, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. And David ran and stood over him and he grabbed the Philistine sword and he pulled it from its sheath and he used it to kill him and he cut off his head. And when the Philistines saw that the hero was dead, they all ran. Tables turned, huh? <laughs> David defeated Goliath and ensured victory for all of Israel, but David didn't stop when he thought it was good enough. He did what God had called him to do, right? Because you remember before the battle started and he said he was going to cut his head off, right? That's what God had called him to do. And so he didn't stop where he thought it was enough. He stopped where God told him to go. Okay, he fulfilled what God called him to do. <clears throat> I 
The reason was so that everybody would know, the world would know that Israel has a God. And then verses 52 and 53, I love this about our Lord. The men of Israel and Judah rallied, shouting their battle cry, and chased the Philistines to the entrance of the valley and to the gates of Ekron. And the Philistine bodies were strewn all along the Sharim road to Gath and Ekron. And when the Israelites returned from the pursuit of the Philistines, they plundered their camps. And David took Goliath's head and brought it to Jerusalem. But he put Goliath's weapons in his own tent. But what I want to point out here is once again the fulfillment of what David said before the battle, right? about the Philistine bodies. But what's great about this and what we've talked about before is that, you know what, even though God fights the battle and God gives us the, God gives us the victory, he lets us share in the reward. If you read over and over again in scripture, when God gave the victory to his people, he allowed them to share the plunder, right? So not only does our God give us the victory, he allows us to share in the reward, even though the victory had nothing to do with our ability. It was all his ability, but he loves us and wants to bless us, and he allows us to share in the reward. So tonight as we close, I just I want you to remember, um, I'm not, I don't have time to go through it, so I'm going to put, I'm just going to have John put some stuff up on the screen right here. It's kind of a, it's a picture in advance of, of Jesus' victory. This story of David and Goliath is a picture in advance of Jesus' victory on the cross. And I thought that these contrasts and comparisons of the two were, were really uh, impactful. And so I'm just going to put them up there. I don't have time to share them with you, and I apologize for that. But I just want to encourage you all as we close now and, and just to remember what God's done for you. Remember what he's done for his people throughout history. Remember that the God of the Old Testament is the same God we serve today, and he'll be the same God that we serve forever. And remember that you might be the David that God uses to fight the battle. Be willing. Be willing, because if you trust him and you put your faith in him, it's a win-win. All right, so let's pray.